sad enough, people walking planet Earth have a problem to accept the reality of extraterrestrials and to accept that those extraterrestrials are already part of their genetic, physical and spiritual makeup. Like the great prophet Nostradamus, Dr. Louis Toury was born and raised in Provence, France. Following four incredible UFO experiences, he was influenced to rekindle Nostradamus's methods and spent many years reviving the seer's rare, Kabbalistic healing method. He moved to the U.S. in 1984 and has since established himself as a successful hypnotherapist, an astropsychologist, author of four books, and a powerful motivational speaker. In 1983, he received a metaphysical doctorate from the Progressive Universal Life Church based in Sacramento, California. His notoriety has skyrocketed after hundreds of accurate predictions such as 9-11, the Asian tsunami, the Iraqi war, the SARS virus, and inarguable predictions of major earthquakes that he made on television and radio programs. There is only two, two group of ETs the positive one and the negative ones. Of course, there is dozens and dozens of names to qualify those entities. There is the Reptilius and there is the Draconis. The Reptilius uh, stimulate the minds of our scientists to weaponize the weather, to create nukes, to create technology that is meant to destroy. While the Draconis are a very different group of extraterrestrials. I call them uh, the gardeners of this world. So these guys stimulate the minds of all humans uh, to create beautiful music, beautiful painting, to create uh, a harmony. So, you know, it comes down to two very specific forces, positive and negative, up and down, black and white, the front, the back male, female, and as human being, we are symmetrical. You have two eyes, two arms, two legs, two sides of the brain. Now you have a reptilian brain and you have a draconis brain. And then once you become cosmic conscious, then you can apply your will or the part of God in each one of us, which is much stronger than those entities. Well, my connection with extraterrestrials started when I was six years old. I am what you call an ADHD. I was born with a tremendous amount of physical and intellectual energy. And by the way, ADD is not a disorder. It's actually a gift. Einstein was ADD. So my parents, to punish me, I hate to be alone. They used to stack me on the attic. And during those days, uh, in 1956, I was six, seven years old during those days, uh, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have running water, all the windows of the house were broken. Going to the attic was like going to hell for me. It was cold. And I was always hoping that before going there I could get a cat, because I could get the warmth from the cat. That night I was really upset, there was no cat, so I knew it was going to be cold. So. I went to bed and my mom was saying to me, Louis, make sure to blow your candle, okay? We don't want to put the fire in the house. So, yeah, yeah, mommy. And in the middle of the night, I felt something on my feet. So I thought it was a cat. So I said, yes. I kick it, trying to get it to come up. Because I didn't want to lose the warmth that I had accumulated into my little blanket. It didn't move. So I said, ah. try it again. It didn't move. So I said, I had to go and get him. So I just sat on my bed and oh my god for the first time in my life I have seen the greys in 1956 we didn't have television we didn't have no uh, UFO speaker no UFO investigator so I had no clue and I used to scream my head off and, and to my mom saying the next day, mom, little monkeys with big eyes, they come every night. My mom saying, oh, you're lying. You're lying. You want to be with your brothers and sisters. You know, from a French Italian background that has eight brothers and sisters, so I hated to be separated. What I did when I first saw them, I hid it because that's, that's the initial response, you know. 
I was traumatized. What the hell is this? You know? Then I get a little bit more courageous and I kind of pip. And one of those entities was less than two inches from my face. Big eyes. I freaked out. I literally freaked out and passed out of fright. This happened so many times. For each time I was punished, I used to see those entities. The good thing about it is that I was okay the next day. I was always okay the next day, so I, I got used to it, put it this way. And incidentally, in 1956, there was quite a lot of reports coming from Russia of those type of monkey. So that was my introduction to the world of extraterrestrials. There's nothing to believe. It was all very real. You know, it's not like a religion, something that you have to be trained to believe. Those guys were there. I couldn't understand what, it, what they were. I did not know what they were doing with me. Little did I know that I had four more extraordinary experiences to go through. I'm now 70 years old and I teach my students incredible experiences, breed incredible people that have incredible wisdom to share. All over the course of my entire life, I've been touched by the divine. And, I, and to these days, I do not know if it's a curse or a blessing because the legacy that all those experiences brought me is just mind boggling. And it's very solid in terms of predictions. Second experience, I was living in England during those days. I was about 18 years old in my second experiences. I got a, a, a bad marriage. I was very, very confused, very, very upset. So it was a really, really tough time. You know, my first marriage was a pretty, pretty emotional situation for me. And I was working in an English camp in the south of France. And then uh, my friend and I, we kind of uh, pick up uh, two nice English girls. And after the season, they went back home. And my friend said to me, you know what, Louis? Maybe we should go there. Well, why not? So it was uh, the end of the season in France, which is September. So I goes, Louis, my guitar, a little short, a little t-shirt, and my friend all on. We took the train and we went to London looking for those two girls. Couldn't speak a word of English. So I landed in Victoria Station. In fact, Victoria Station was my home for three months. I was leave I was homeless. I couldn't speak a word. I used to sing to make money. But there is a mafia in the tubes in Piccadilly Circus in London. You know, English. Bagger, they don't like French bagger. I was singing French and make money. So we had a fight that they broke my guitar, they threw all my stuff under the tramway. Then I was really, really honest. And I was begging money. And I never ever forget, this is funny, but it's true, part of my crazy experiences. I had like a few peas and I went shopping with that. So I looked for the cheapest tin that I could find. Bought it, went back to Victoria Station, to my bank, which was my place. And I Opened my tin and I start to shoot it. It was chunky, huh? Hmm, interesting. Then I pick up my English French dictionary and I thought, dog food, what does it mean? This is how I've learned English, my friend. <laughs> but one of my experiences that I had, I like to reflect back now to these to those days. It was pretty incredible. I was knocking all the doors all around the Victoria Station. Monsieur, Madame, est-ce que vous avez du travail pour moi? I could only speak French. Everybody was looking at me. What the hell are you talking about? What do you want? Who are you? I was asking for a job. Of course, I couldn't find a job because I couldn't speak English. Luckily for me, there was this old lady with a bunch of plastic bag going to the trash. So I helped her and she goes, uh, what are you doing here? Thank you for helping me. It's very nice of you. Because she saw me, I was dirty, I had beard, I was homeless, smelly, long hair, three months. And then I, I answered her in French. And luckily for me, this lady was from Switzerland. And she just lost her husband and she was running a bed and breakfast. And she said, oh, well, you know what, I can help you. You can come and clean my, the plate and help the, the bed and breakfast and then get enough money to go back home. So I was very happy about the idea. And as soon as I walk in, she says, oh, you can eat anything you want. 
Oh my God, another funny experience. My friend. I stuffed myself with eggs until I turned yellow. <laughs> I never forget that. I had my first English girlfriend because I never met those girls again. We never found them. It was ridiculous to go there. And then from there, I went to Victoria Station, listening. There was a long line of telephone during those days. I don't know if they are still there. I have been didn't go back there for a while. And I was just walking up and down, hoping to hear something that sound French. And I heard this guy. He was talking French on the phone. So I said, hey, hey, uh, I need a job. Is there any way you can help me with some French people? The guy said, well, you know what? I am a manager at the Grand Hotel in Eastbourne in Sussex. So tell you what, you go there and I give you a job. Thank you very much. And I went to Eastbourne and I started to work right in the basement cleaning the floor and uh, sleeping with cucarachs that size <laughs> it was pretty 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 tough i had to work really 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 hard to be able to afford uh the ship to cross the channel and then from there take the train it takes me down the south of France. So I had to work weeks, if not months, before I could save the money. So I couldn't go home when I felt like. So I was lucky enough to have enough money and I just did that. And I arrived home and I was very happy to see my brothers and sisters and my mom. And then I said, where is Noelle? Noelle is uh, my uh, older sister. And my mom said, oh, she went to work. So I was kind of upset because not meeting Noel now means I might not see her for another year or so. And then, here she is, she came back, she was quite upset. And she says, oh my gosh, mom, I missed the bus. It was Sunday. Uh, I had to go back to work on Monday. And if I, if I don't, if I don't, if I'm not on there on time, they're going to fire me. So she was pretty upset. And my mom says, oh, don't you worry. Louis is going to give you a ride. Remember, I'm 18 years old. Cell phone didn't exist. The only way for me to go from A to Z was every few miles to ask directions. It's 4, 4.30 in the morning. I'm exhausted. I'm driving in those high mountains. There is snow everywhere. I'm doing all that I can to stay awake. And then finally, down the bottom of a valley, I saw some light. And to these days, I mean, this is not America, where you have hotels and restaurants, McDonald's, open 24-7. This is the south of France, in the middle of the mountains. That tells you what extraterrestrials are able to create as far as the environment is concerned. Didn't know then. I was so happy because I knew I was going to get a cup of coffee and I was going to be asking direction to take my sister wherever she, she wanted, had to go. There was nobody there. It's important to pay attention to that information. There was nobody, just me. I wake my sister up. And I was kind of surprised because uh, when I asked her, you know, we're going to stop, we're going to drink what you want to drink. Uh, she says, I want a Coca-Cola. Remember, it's, it is snow, there's ice and she wants a Coca-Cola. <laughs> so you don't forget that. I'm very protective. Okay? I'm half French, half Italian. And when I opened the door, I saw three guys in the bar. But to me, those guys were like giants. I thought they were loggers. They would make a footballer look like a kid. They're so tall. So I said to my sister, okay, you stay by the door and I'm going to go and get you your Coke. So I went to the bar and I asked the barman for a Coca-Cola and for a cup of coffee. And I was looking at those guys. They were like, their face was like no motion, They're frozen. They were looking straight ahead of them. They were not talking to each other. They were just like robots. Men in black, maybe. So that was my first impression of these monster guys. In fact, my nose was at their belt. I was really, really insecure looking at these guys. Then the one on my left looked down at me like this. And he goes, do you want to play card? I looked at him and I said, you know what? I'm very tired. I don't want to play cards, just want a cup of coffee and take my sister to work. He says, come on, come on, you, you're going to be friends with cards. I did not know how right it was when he said that. I'm 70 years old, I still cannot play poker or 21. I only play tower cards. 
They need to end as a winner, right? And they do other things with cards to prove the reality of extraterrestrial at the therapeutic level. It's a long story. So anyway, he insisted, and because you know he's big and there's two more, might as well just be nice and you know comply. He said, okay. So he had a regular pack of cards and he presented them to me. So he says, pick a card. So I pick a card, and as soon as my eyes saw the card, he's telling me what it is. It was interesting. So I said, well, interesting. So yeah, pick another one. So I pick another one. Did the same thing. Then another one. Then another one. Like I didn't want to do it, but he, he kind of insisted, pick a card, pick a card. And then, in my mind, and believe me, I have better thing to say than to make up stories. What I'm going to tell you is very real. Okay. He says, as in my mind, I thought, I am going to change the nine of diamond for the queen of spade. In my mind. Because he has got to be in my head, this guy, to do that. Then he looked at me from his hive. And he says, Louis, never told him my name. You are not going to change the nine of diamond for the queen of spade. At that very precise moment, I felt like a screwdriver was coming here and coming out there. I was at the bar like this, I was holding the bar like this, trying to keep my balance. And I do not know if, if I went to the bathroom for my own will or if they told me to go to the bathroom. All I knew is that I needed cold water on my face because I was about to pass out. And I went to the bathroom which was less than 10 feet away and the door was wide open. I opened the tab, I put some water in my face, but I felt like if I had a chain. And I was talking to this guy in my head. And I said, I don't know who you are. I don't know where the hell you came from. I don't care how big you are. You are going to tell me what you're doing to me. Because I felt so invaded, so... There is no word, and unless you go through it, you, you cannot really understand the depth of the emotion and the trauma I was going through. Less than, what, 30 seconds? How long does it take to do this? And go. Went back to the bar, gone. I look at my sister, she was still like sleeping. Feel good about that. I asked the barman, I said, who's those guys? I don't know. They must have driven here. Remember, there was no car. I said, no, there was no car. I don't know, they just left, just now. So I went outside. And I look and I listen and I look again and I listen completely gone then that's where I wake up my sister and remember all this is so clear like it happened five minutes ago I wake my sister up and I said let's get the hell out of here okay and that's it that's all I remember the next the next things I know is nine o'clock or so the next day. I'm driving, I'm entering my, my village. Now, where have I been all night? And to this day, I asked my sister, do you recall? She said, yes, I recall everything until I fell asleep. I don't recall even drinking my Coke, but I don't remember if, if you took me or not to, 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 the, to where I worked. And I don't recall it either. But the most important part of all this incredible second UFO experience is that those guys left me with a headache that I would never wish to my worst enemy. For weeks, for weeks, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. What did they do to my head? I have no idea. So that is experience number two. After this experience uh, uh, with my sister, I went back to England and I, something really weird happened to my mind. I could not recall my lyrics. It's like if I was not able anymore to sing, even the song that I wrote, my memory was shattered and I couldn't understand what I managed still to get a recording deal. And then uh, in one of my trip back home, I stayed with my brother. Now, my older brother, Joe, kind of a, you know, 
big mafioso guy, you know, hotels, restaurants, discotheques, and bars, you know. Um, I used to stay with him in his farm, which is about five miles away from the village. And every single night, we used to take off around 10 o'clock. Because, you know, the discotheque, we had to drive through the vineyards that would take us to the main road, main road to the highway. Another, let's say an hour later, we are at the discotheque and we open the discotheque around 11 o'clock. That was just, you know, the, the typical routine. November 11, 1981. Okay. Can't forget that. November 11, 1981. Just after 10, like we did every single night, we were driving through the vineyard. My brother, during those days, drove a brand new Mercedes. I own one right now, and they are very reliable. Okay, those guys, those, guys, those guys don't die just like that. So we were driving through the vineyard, and I asked my brother, Hey, Joe, I, there's light. Is, is that people working in the vineyard? Yet? My brother is kind of a you know, Scorpio guy, rough, right, straight to the point, sarcastic. Louis, we pick up the vine, the grapes, in September. It's November. In other words, he doesn't talk much, you know, like old Scorpio, right to the point. But I keep insisting. I said, Joe, something is not right. There's light over there. Look, they're moving. And then, and then, the car died. And on top of the car, all I could see was light and light. My brother says, oh my gosh, the helicopter here? I said, the helicopter make a floppy noise. This, this is a humming noise. So I said to him, I'm going to go and look. He said, are you crazy? He grabbed my hand. So I was able to get away from his grab. I opened the door and I went outside and I look up. I could not see nothing but light blinding me. So it took me a while, but I couldn't look. And then they turned the light off. That tells me that those extraterrestrials who was flying that saucer knew that they were blinding me. They were hurting me. So they turned the light off. It took me like, I don't know, a minute or so for my eye to adapt. And oh my God, oh my God, 30 feet suspended above a dead Mercedes, a flying saucer. I was banging the front of the car and screaming every bad French word that I knew, asking my brother to get out. Of course, he did not. <laughs> and you know what? There is no words uh, to explain such an experience now you are now forced to face reality it is not a dream anymore it's not a question anymore it's it's fact a flying saucer is suspended above my head and they said oh well if you go too close to a flying saucer you're going to be cooked i wasn't cooked then in the middle of the flying saucer different light came down all of a sudden all the light comes on again and that flying saucer that was stationary just flew out and flew barely five feet above the cheminée of the farm that was across the street, the, the, the road. My brother, the first thing he says to me, Louis, this did not happen. Don't talk to nobody. Okay. In fact, he waited 35 years. And finally, he said, oh, you know what? Our children need to know the truth. Yeah, Louis was right when he said we saw a flying saucer. So for 30 years or so, he kept it a secret because he didn't want now listen to this. Normally when we arrive at the discotheque around 11 o'clock, because we open at 12, we stay open all night, or oh, 11.30, um, we, we have the barman, we have the waitresses, uh, uh, we have uh, people working. We are about to start to open the discotheque. When we arrive, the discotheque was full and running. So there is another lapse of time, another uh, abduction that took place for the first time in my life, and for the last time in my life, I've seen my brother smoking and drinking. First time and last time. And I was doing the, uh, the same thing on the other side of the bar. We were looking at each other and said, what the hell just happened here? And then the next day, of course, it was all over the news, all over the, the places, because we're not the only one who saw the flying saucers in the south of France. But believe me, this is not, a, I'm past believing UFOs now. Comes number four, which is extraordinarily dramatic. I went back to England and I met this guy from the United States. 
And I said, you know, I, I never, I never seen a dollar. Can you show me a dollar? He said, I don't have a dollar, but I have a quarter. I said, okay. So he gave me the, the quarter and I, I put it on a cross and he gave me his card. And he said, if you go to San Diego, hey, I'll be there to help you. I was so happy. I worked so hard for three or four months. I finally flew to the United States and I arrived in San Diego and I went straight to the address. And I arrived at the address. There was two old guys, retirees. And I said, hey, can I speak to John? John who? I, I don't know. He gave me his card. Is that the right address? She says, yes, the right address. And there was a telephone. Remember, I didn't have a cell phone. That was in 1984. I said, can you call? I said, yeah, yeah, we're going to call. So they called. Nobody at the end. I'm still looking for John. I've been on radio, been on TV, George Norrie, 40 million people. I've been in so many TV. John would have seen me, would have heard about me and my stories. So what happened there? I don't know. I got married and I said to my wife, you know, honey, I tell you what, um, I've been delegating with extraterrestrial my life and maybe one day you'll be touched. Little did I know what was going to happen to that poor girl. Brigitte was very... Uh, pretty, very beautiful, and she was doing beauty pageant. And that night, uh, that day, she says to me, well, there is a big pageant going on in Anaheim at the Hilton Hotel, just before Disneyland. So I want to go there and participate. I say, okay, no problem. So we need to go to bed and have your beauty sleep so you can win. Oh my gosh. Again, in the middle of the night, she woke up, she was crying, she was trembling, she was on the fittest position in the floor, she was going like this. I in 10 years of marriage, I never seen my wife in such state. I was scared of what's going on with her. I never seen her like that. She made me look under the bed. She made me look in the cupboard, in the basement. She says, there's something in the house. She had a premonition to what was going to happen the next day. So I said, oh my gosh. The clock rang in the morning and I look at her and said, you know what, you look like hell. So there's no point of going in there. She says, no, no, I want to go. I don't want to stay in the house. I want to go. So. Knowing, I had a feeling that something wrong was going to happen that day, okay? Uh, so I, I really, really pay attention of the date. Remember November 11, 1981? That was August 11, 1991, okay? Important to pay attention to the date because this is real. It was about 8 o'clock. I just finished to fill up my tank. And there we go. I'm, I'm on high five with my wife. And as I was driving, I kind of ask her if she was okay what what happened last night she says i don't want to talk about it so i keep driving and all of a sudden i felt like if i drove into a cloud the last thing i remember is driving through a bridge called um jambore jambore road that's the last thing i remember i didn't feel the wheel in the car anymore and then i talked i said honey i don't recognize anything where are we she says honey you're gonna make me late hurry hurry I didn't see the sign of Los Angeles or Disneyland for that matter. You're going to make, you, we're going to be late. So I need to get prepared. So please move on. Because I, I said, I don't, I don't know where we are. I, I'm going to exit. So I took the first exit. She was upset. And then I drove into a parking lot and there was three Mexican guy on the back of a white Toyota and they were eating. So I went to them and I said, excuse me, could you tell me where I am? All those guys were looking at me like, don't do that like a you smoke too much pot, which I never do. I don't drink and I don't smoke. They said you are at the Los Angeles Zoo. Now, Los Angeles Zoo is 90 miles north. Whoa, wait a minute here. I said, okay, what time is it, please? And they said, it's nine o'clock. Now, if I drive a Ferrari, if there is no traffic in Los Angeles or no cops to stop me at 150 miles per hour, I could have done the trip. It took me over two, uh, two and a half hours to go back to where we're supposed to be. My wife and I, we were completely... And then as she was taking a shower, she said, honey, look, look. She showed me above the airline, she had a scar, a scar of two inches or more, like a laser cat. What is this? What is this? So I don't know. Then um, after that, she called a friend and she disappeared. She completely disappeared. She divorced me. It was pretty hard on me. What happened is, I met this guy, he was a UFO researcher, and he says to me, I have two very top of the line hypnotherapists. 
in Victorville in California and I told them your situation because I spoke to him first. He was the first guy I ever spoke about UFOs. Uh, and they're going to get two cameras, they're going to freeze the first frame and the last frame and an hour later, you know, we're going to see what's going on. So they hypnotized me. And I mean, now and a half later, you can see not even the movement of my shirt. I was so gone. It's only when I say I'm hot, I'm hot, I'm hot, that you see me sweating, literally sweating back. What happened is they suck us into the belly of a flying saucer. Those three guys that I saw with my sister were into the flying saucer. And I was saying to my wife, honey, um, it's all good. Don't you worry, been there, done that before. Uh, everything, is, it will be fine. It's like I had an agreement to whatever horrific thing was going to happen later, okay? Uh, but I had an agreement for some reason. I was not upset. So that's when I went into that little room and I saw the earth that size. I had to tell you in the mothership how far I was up there. And then when, after a certain time, it was really, really, really hot. And then you see me in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the hypnotic session, just literally sweating back. It's, when I was in that uh, decontaminating room before getting inside of the saucer. Then I went inside and that's where I saw the greys, you know, doing the electronics, flying the saucer, whatever they were doing. And I knew exactly where to go when I saw my wife. They were taking the fetus of our child. My wife was three months pregnant. And to this day, my wife, they, they erased that memory. They erased the memory. She does not know. She says, I was never pregnant, if you ask her. She has never been pregnant. She was three months pregnant. And most of all, that was incredible. How is it possible for them to cut my wife to two, two and a half inches, okay, and to have it heal almost immediately? So that was something incredible. Then I went into another room and I sat. I was free to move. And something came down from the ceiling. It was like a helmet. Stop at my nose. And then I felt like electricity, the concrete, fire. I had like an implosion. And that's where the extraterrestrial downloaded the secrets of the cosmic code. And I was forced after that to rekindle Nostradamus 16th century divine astrology. After that, of course, she was so upset. When I told her, honey, remember I told you we might have to go through some, this type of experience? She said, well, next time we go through LA and I don't see it, let me know. Okay, she refused to accept the reality that we were 90 miles north. And then it was so dramatic that she kicked my butt. And then I was depressed and really, really depressed. And that opened the door to, of course, cancer. And, and then my two oncologists said to me, uh, you know, you need to go through chemotherapy. Make sure it doesn't come back. And I refused. My little voice, ET, told me to go shopping, shopping. So I went to the vegetable area and I saw a bunch of roots, a bunch of vegetable that I never seen before, I never tested before. I bought everything at home, juice everything, put some honey and drank it. Felt like tornado inside and the cancer never came back. I called it the universal blood transfusion. And then came the ultimate the ultimate UFO experience. And I have the proof. I have the pictures. It was um, during the solar eclipse in 2012. My wife, my other wife, my new wife, 10 years married now, she wanted to take a pictures of the solar eclipse. And I said, well, you can do that, but don't look, whatever it is. So she went outside and I was in front of her and I turned around. And then she went jum, 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 six times. She took six shots and I was going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because she was looking through it and I was afraid for her eyes. And oh my gosh, when we developed these pictures, you could see Draco. It's a horb. And believe me, you cannot duplicate this regardless how good you are with Photoshop. You could see that horb coming to me getting closer and closer and closer, entering my third eye and coming out of my heart. And since that day, I have been making predictions that are well-documented, 
dated and unarguable about earthquakes above 6.0. I was on George Norrie, 40 million people listening to me. I said, be ready for fire and we're going to lose a hell of a lot of wildlife. A week and a half later, Australian fire killed millions of animals. And I said, be careful, there is a new disease coming for the lungs. And next thing you know, I give the exact date for 9-11 with all the details. I give exact dates for a terrorist attack, which brought the FBI twice in my house. I'm not making it up. Those guys, two of them, twice, they thought I was a sleeping cell. They checked everything in my house, my statue with my residence. And I told them, how do you know it was going to be an attack in New York and in Paris? How did you know? I said, I develop a software. I'm using Nostradamus astrology. You know, the, the stars are more than dead rock hanging up there for the sake of beauty. Uh, unlike NASA scientists, I realized that we are part of a magnificent design and those stars speak. They speak. God created the stars and the heavens for more than the sake of beauty, I told them. He gave them to us for interpretation so that we may lead a safer, more productive life. And I said, remember, some of the greatest mind on the planet, like Tesla. Tesla said, there is a core in the universe. In this core, you can have all the answers to what it means to be human also. And he said, I never discovered this core, but I know it exists. I had this core downloaded by the extraterrestrials. And I prove it through my UFO predictive legacy. When I look at people, when I read, and when they give me their date of birth, they become an open book. And I shock them. I know things that only them know. I make predictions that are scary. This is why earlier I said to you, is all those experiences who build doctor to re literally kill me and rebirth me in a different human being. All those experiences occur or a blessing for humanity. At that point, I'm still wondering if I should, you know, give all the explanation to where all those entities come from and what they are. Remember what I said earlier? There is only two groups of ETs and there are a lot of names. If you want, you can put some wings on their back. Now, Falling Angel or Garden Angel, whatever names you want to give. There's plenty of names for those entities, but there are only two. The good one and the bad one. Now, understand, the reptilians are a group of extraterrestrials that have their base on Pluto, which is at the verge of our solar system. Pluto is known in Greek mythology as the Lord of Hell. Uh, it is also the underworld, it regulates also the criminal element. It's all about death and drama, this dark planet, it regulates Scorpio, the rebirthing process. The reptilians can only survive like a dog, like fleas on a dog, with your fear, with your negativity, with uh, insecurity. And they have a lot of tools, especially legal and illegal drugs. So if you keep doing if you keep being negative, you affect the atomic structure of your body and you make yourself very, very receptive to infection, infect yourself, organism or cancer. That's why I got cancer. And they, they can only survive and operate through dark matter. So they are in human's head. They are already part of our uh, genealogy. They're already part of our composition, of our atomic structure, and they are talking to us on, uh, at, at a psychical level. Now, this does not mean that they do not, uh, uh, they do not use their ships for specific purpose. The Galactic Federation or Grand Cosmic Order, Draco told me, okay, the GTI channel, uh, 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 do not want any extraterrestrials to interfere with humans' affair. Of course, the reptilians don't care. They constantly uh, abduct human beings to make them feel depressed and negative and to the point where they get completely infected and then they get a machine gun and they go and kill everybody and kill themselves. Okay? Then and you have the, uh, those same entities or some negative extraterrestrials, the reptilians. They stimulate the mind of a scientist to weaponize the weather, to create uh, nukes, to create viruses. 
So when people say, oh, I want to look for extraterrestrials, you don't have to look, they're already part of you. Remember, two eyes, two arms, two legs, two sides of the brain, you're symmetrical, positive, negative. It's either you work for the negativity, for evil, for the reptilians, who can control your life because they're all cosmic conscious, they can use your stars or your UCI, your unique celestial identity, or you work for the Dracarnis, which are fed from the sun. You know, when people ask me, how can I attract extraterrestrials? Well, look, look, this is gold, all right? This is a metal that is used to show love, to show the forces of the sun, and they never rest. Now, what is the opposite of gold? Steel. What do you do with steel? You make gun, grenade, firearms, tanks, okay? So, if you want to attract the good extraterrestrial, wear gold, be positive, and realize extraterrestrials do not come in this dense physical world when they feel like they have to use a uranic window. We are right here, right now, into this uranic window. This energy is right here with us right now. So if you wanna look for UFO or talk about UFO, we are doing it right now because there are no accidents. It's all preset by the cosmic code. So it's very, very important to realize that the part of God in us is much stronger than those entity or even our negative stars. If you are cosmic conscious, you can apply your will and make a choice. I do not want to work for darkness. I refuse to be depressed. I don't need drugs, okay, to get a kick. Instead, I'm going to let uh, the Dracani stimulate my mind to create beautiful music, to create nice painting. You know, they stimulate the mind of Mozart and Beethoven to create incredible music. They are constantly bombarding humans right here within the... It's all a, uh, uh, UFOs is a psychical phenomenon. The last thing they want is people like me to delegate with the spirit. That's why they will pick scientists to talk about UFOs. They are rational, they are practical, believe me. Extraterrestrials are master of matter, master engineer from the extreme. They do not care who you are. If you're the president, they don't care of your education. They do not care of your position. They have lost something that people like me were born with. They have lost the spirit. They have lost their identity. They have lost their connection with God and the divine. And humanity is moving in that direction. And that's why everything is rational and is practical. Because the more you delegate with the tree, the less you're going to see the forest. This solar system was built by the Dracanis. And the moon, for example, they hire, for lack of words, one of the moon from Jupiter. And again, for the lack of words, let's use a nuclear device calculated forces from their ship, they removed the moon from Jupiter and brought it into the solar system, so to speak, okay, which is also part having Jupiter in it. And um, that's why the moon is, is loaded with crater and we are next door, we don't have as many crater. And people think of the moon as a dead rock hanging out there for the sake of beauty. No, the moon regulates human emotions. That's where the word lunatic, moody, crabby comes from. The moon cycle is exactly the same cycle that woman menstruation. The moon is so very powerful, but people do not know their relationship with the moon. They do not know that Saturn also is the, the great malefic planet. Wherever Saturn is located in your chart, you're going to be stimulated uh, to work hard, to get discipline. And th this, this is a really, really tough planet that you need to understand the positive and negative of those planets. Our solar system is set by those extraterrestrials and those planets have energy that interact with your mind. Now, there is no difference between your mind, my mind, Einstein mind or a killer. It's the same density, same weight, same wiring. What's different? Your UCI, your unique celestial identity. You're related to your mom and your dad, you know, genetically 100%, DNA wise, but 
you're never going to think, behave, create, or have the same fate than your mom, your dad, your brother, or your sister. In fact, your family members are your biggest strangers because you do not have the same star pattern that was created by God's immaculate universal design that involve the reality of those entities which are playing part because you cannot have a day without a night, a man without a woman, a front without a back, a positive without a negative, the yin and yang. Two eyes, two arms, two legs, it's all about a very simplistic uh, way. The phenomenon is psychical. And again, as I said earlier, the Galactic Federation Grand Cosmic Order, you know, forbidden any of these ETs to deal with us. But in some case, you have the abductees and the contactees. I'm a contactees, which means my mission was already preset when I was a child. And what's scary is all those extraterrestrials are cosmic conscious. They know all about the cosmic code jurisdiction. And they can use those energy when you are at your weakest point. And they can turn you into a lunatic. The idea is to understand the process and use the power of God in us, as I said earlier, to only aim for the light. So far, we got to keep the balance just to survive. But we are going to be moving further and faster and accelerate our vibration into the light, which means our vibrational system is going to be as fast as the one of those extraterrestrials which will become, finally, a reality. Astrology claims to divine information about people and earthbound events by studying the movements and relative positions of celestial objects. Astrology has been dated to at least the second millennium BCE. Many cultures have attached importance to astronomical events, and some, such as the Hindus, Chinese, and the Mayans, have developed elaborate systems for predicting terrestrial events from celestial observations. Western astrology, one of the oldest astrological systems still in use, can trace its roots to 17th century Mesopotamia, where it spread to ancient Greece, Rome, the Arab world, and eventually Central and Western Europe. Contemporary Western astrology is often associated with systems of horoscopes that purport to explain aspects of a person's personality and predict significant events in their lives based on the positions of celestial objects. Testing the validity of astrology can be difficult because there is no consensus amongst astrologers as to what astrology is or what it can predict. Most professional astrologers are paid to predict the future to describe a person's personality and life. First of all, you have to realize that astronomy is a byproduct of astrology. Astrology is a much older science. The first astronomers who challenged God with mathematics, they stole the clay tablets and mathematically they calculated the exact time of an eclipse and that's when human or scientists went against God and thought themselves better than God. Astrology is very, very real, but it's not a religion. You don't believe in astrology. It takes any of my students at least six or seven hours a day for a full week before they can understand the universal mechanics and, you know, you got people like uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, you know, very wealthy, powerful man. You know, he said millionaires don't use astrology, billionaires do. You will see the Pope, old popes being taught astrology by the Vatican Council, and you will see old popes being enthroned under the sign of Leo. But they don't want you to know. Religions, and there is, what, 875 different denominations, okay? They bring chaos. They breed ISIS who want to kill you if you don't follow their caliphate. In fact, religions have killed more people than all the disease, than all the natural disasters and, and, and all the wars combined together. That's a fact. All disappear civilization use astrology. Astrology is the mother of all science. And the father of medicine himself said, a physician cannot call himself a physician if he 
does not master astrology. Now you're talking about the father of modern medicine. People who have a problem with astrology, there's two reasons. Either they've been indoctrinated and think that, well, they're going to go to hell if they listen to me, not realizing you're already on hell. You're not going to go to hell. This is it. <laughs> um, it's a lack of information and it's indoctrinated by fear. But Nostradamus astrology, when I tell you on that date, it's going to be an earthquake, you're going to have fire killing animals in Australia, or you're going to have a disease, a new lung disease, and you see it and it's dated and it's on national radio and it's on my YouTube video and it's on my book and my newsletter. You can't deny it. You'll deny it only if the reptilians really, really got your head and stop you to dig into the spirit because that is how we're going to be able to beat them by using their own tools, the mind. I make regular predictions. I got about 10,000 people that have signed up to my private website, The Cosmic Code. We have different uh, horoscopes, for the lack of word, let's call it horoscopes, uh, daily guidance and forecast. We give you, we translate the energy. Why, in the name of God, would you sign up for conspiracy talking head, religious lunatics, apocalyptic promoter, ev evil feeders? Why? Do not do that to yourself. Do not do that to the world. Because you ain't conscious or not, you are responsible. Uh, but in my case, remember, I had to rebuild Nostradamus astrology. Nostradamus was using quatrains. His quatrain was really blurry because he had to keep his head. And he was, I, I mean, the French Inquisition would kill him. So he had to keep his work very blurry, very mystical. Mine are wide open, very clear, plain English, and most of all, you have a set of key words. When I said earthquakes, sudden release of energy, news from the cosmos, NASA, explosion. We had an explosion not long ago. It was predicted. When I tell you I predict uh, 911. You can read it. It's, it's in my books. It's dated. I was on George Norrie, 40 million people listening to me, and I told him, be ready for thousands of people uh, being forced to relocate in about two weeks from today. And here goes Katrina, two weeks later. It's on the website. You can read it. I put the green by the mouth. That makes the difference. I am the only living astrophile who works like Nostradamus, who makes quatrain. And I added, as I said, my obvious keywords. So when you join the Cosmic Code, and I'm going to invite you, you're going to be able to assimilate how Nostradamus used to work. Now remember, 500 years ago, the great prophet didn't have the luxury of a watch or a computer. So the astrology of practice is very symbolic, highly spiritual. And God thanks Draco, who channeled more information to make me even more scaringly accurate. However, not everybody will respond to science. In my case, I'm terrible when it comes to math. But on the other hand, I'm extremely creative and highly spiritual. I'm an artist. I play piano, I play guitar and all that good stuff. You can only relate to people because of their experiences, their education, their intelligence, most of all because of their stars. And that's where my dilemma start and finished. 99.9 .9 of human beings walking planet Earth do not have cosmic consciousness. They did not take the time to understand the face and the tools of God, to understand his immaculate universal cosmic design. They don't have the mind, they are too rational, they are born practical, they are born scientists, they are born atheists, like you have people that are born religious fanatics. And that's the beauty of being human. But the beauty also of having deep, developed cosmic consciousness is that you do not judge people anymore. There is so many gods, so many religions. Okay? The beauty of astrology is that you, you can be a Muslim, you can be Christians, you can be a Jew. You have a sun sign, you have a moon sign. So astrology unified, religion separate. And that's why 
the reptilians have developed and made a culture of scientists who lack the natural aptitude to enter the archetypal realm of supra cosmic consciousness. Again, as I said earlier, you're not going to be teaching Michael Jackson to sing and dance. You got to have it. If you don't have it, then you have extraterrestrials that are going to be looking for people who have the stars that will support their mission. And they're going to become a contacting, not an abducting. For example, we can talk about uh, um, Travis Walton. You know, he was born with the moon in Aquarius, so you got, he already has the essence. Aquarius is the energy of uh, friends and wishes and UFOs. And he's also an Aries. Which means he doesn't think. He, this is the first sign of the zodiac, so he acts upon impulse. When he saw that UFOs, instead of running away, he just went under it. Now remember, gold and metal? He was in a truck loaded with tools that cut trees. And it's Arizona, which means I carry my gun, and all those guys out there carry their gun and then hatches, and so. All this metal, all this metal was a magnet to attract a scout, a reptilian ship that literally electrocuted him. He was not invited. Then it took five days for the Draconis to put him back together and bring him back life and, and drop it somewhere. This is the explanation I have to. But Travis was born with the tail of the dragon in Taurus. He is very normal guy, it's very rational, he doesn't believe in astrology. It's a miracle that he's into a UFO because he was thrown into it by accident, put it this way. I know him very well. We've been doing a cruise together, a UFO cruise in Mexico. He has not even an ego. He's a beautiful, loving guy, been victimized by the reptilians and saved by the Draconis, but he has no clue. You know, you've been designed You've been designed to, uh, to react to your environment because of your stars. If you're a Scorpio, well, you're going to be into politics, into structure, you're going to have a rational mind. But at the same time, your soul's purpose as a Scorpio is to dig into metaphysics. That's where you regenerate. You also have a stinger. Make sure not to use it against you or against other people because you could be your worst enemy being a Scorpio. Now, you also have a dragon, a dragon's head and a dragon's tail. In fact, there is more power in the location of your dragon alone than the entire complexity of an astrological chart. But when you go now to Asia, what is the dragon? What is something you celebrate once a year and you dance around? The Asiatic people have lost the power of the dragon. Like here in the Oriental and Occidental astrology, you have 12 signs. They use the tiger, they use the dog, they use the pig. We are using the Taurus, the Scorpion, the, the Aries. But it's the same energy. That's Jesus' initial ministry, representing the 12 signs of the Zodiac, the 12 hours of the day, the 12 sins, the 12 jury, the 12 tribe of Israel, the 12 notes of music. When you talk about astrology, you are talking about the 12 apostles. But... When Jesus wanted to introduce humanity to our Father in the heavens, okay, all he had in mind is to teach astrology. That's really, really deep. That's why, as I said earlier, the Vatican on the 175 miles of secret library has all those information and they use for them because that's too much power for you. They don't want to give it to you. But they use for them. So when you look at it, Jesus' initial cosmic ministry has been completely erased and changed and turned into a junk. God never came down and wrote no books, my friend. He never wrote the Bible, but he made stars. And that's where you need to use critical thinking and realize that this is what's going on. People have been indoctrinated. Do not touch the spirit. Do not touch astrology. Because if you do so, you're going to own the truth of what it means to be human. You're going to understand God's cosmic design. You're going to be able to relate to Jesus' initial cosmic ministry, speaking the soul of the 12 apostles or the 12 signs of the Zodiac. There's so much that people do not know. It's a disaster for 
those kids not to know their relationship with the divine. It's okay to teach a child uh, geometry, uh, science, history, the art. Now, who is there to teach them who they are? And then you wonder why they are killing themselves in our college university non-stop. It will never stop unless we go back and teach them. For example, let's say you have a, a Scorpio kid. Okay, extraordinarily powerful to start with. Okay, it's a very resentful sign. You talk to a child this way, you show the symbol of the scorpion. You see the scorpion, you see this ugly insect, you see the poison being sarcastic and stinging people and being revengeful and nasty and hurting yourself. No, you have to kill the scorpion and you have to build the eagle because Scorpio is the only sign who can turn into the eagle and from his ashes turn into a majestuous, fantastic eagle above everything that is thrown at his dramatic fate. So these kids, if this kid has no information of who he is, or where he came from and his connection with the divine, well, he's gonna look on the internet, he's gonna sign up for any of these religion, that's not gonna work, then he's gonna take drugs, he's gonna get depressed, he's gonna be infected by the reptilians, he's gonna get a machine gun, he's gonna kill everybody, he's gonna say goodbye, boom. That's what's going on. We need to bring this cosmic wisdom into our college university. We need to bring it uh, as it used to be, Okay, in disappear civilization and accept it as a serious, very serious, solid discipline. Until we do so, we will never ever stop the endless chain of suicide and the endless shootings. Never. It can't happen. Now I can start regenerating the spirit of all those children.